Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our fifth and final Scandinavian Films webinar as part of CAN 2020 online. My name is Wendy Mitchell. I'm a journalist and a film festival consultant, and I'm also your moderator today. Uh, you've got a great session ahead, um, talking to some amazing filmmakers working across the Nordic countries, telling us how they've gotten their first features made. Um, I hope you noticed I have a new palm tree today. It's our last session and we can celebrate. Um, I think today's session is gonna be really useful for a lot of people. Um, if I may editorialize a second before we start, um, if we've got anybody who's you know up very early in New York and tuning in and they're gonna be saying, my God, uh, these people get government funding to make their films, isn't that wonderful? Or aren't I jealous? Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's one thing to acknowledge up front that, you know, it's, it's the system of, of government support in Europe is, is very different to a lot of, of other countries, like in the States where you've got no government support for filmmaking. So it's a really wonderful cultural backing that we do have filmmakers who can make some films with some support from the government. Um, but also just to say, you know, that doesn't mean it's just totally easy for them. They don't just like knock on the Film Institute door and get a sack of cash. Um, it's very competitive to get that funding. It is, um, yeah, they don't just give it to anyone. It's sort of the best and the brightest who rise to the top and get the funding. And, you know, usually even the, when the funding is generous, you still need other sources of income to pump into your film finance. Um, so that's just a little backdrop of, you know, if we're not just talking about how to get these films financed today, we're going to be talking more creatively as well. But I just wanted to mention that, um, that yes, we are aware that in Scandinavia, there's lovely support for filmmaking, but it's not ever enough. And it's not ever enough for everybody who wants to make a film. So we're glad it's there, but it's not perfect. And don't just think it's easy for these filmmakers to show up and just get handed any cash they want. So that's off my soapbox this morning. Um, we've got six amazing writer directors here. We're gonna talk about, you know, a little bit about the films themselves. I hope you'll wanna be learning about their films. Um, you know, the creativity they've pulled together, how long it's taken them to come to their first feature. Um, also, you know, maybe some ideas about getting these first features seen by audiences, because that's another important piece of the puzzle. So I will stop yabbering on this morning and, introduce our six speakers. Uh, from Finland, we have Kadar Ahmed, who is writer director of The Gravedigger. From Sweden, Natalie Alvarez Messin, who is writer director of Clara Sola. From Norway, Erika Kolmeyer, writer director of Storm. From Iceland, Tina Hrafenstadter, who is writer director of Quake. From Denmark, Lisa Jespersen, who is writer director of Persona Non Grata. And not, last but not least, we have from Sweden, Nina Tiberg, who is the writer director of Pleasure. And uh, this film you might have heard about because it's gotten the Cannes 2020 label, the seal of approval that has been selected for this strange year of Cannes. So congratulations to Nina, and we look forward to hearing more about that film. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, the chat bar is closed, but the Q&A button is open. So if you have questions for any of the filmmakers or for the group of them, please put that in the Q&A button at any time and I'll keep an eye on that as we have time. So without further ado, uh, we are going to start meeting these filmmakers and we'll go through the around them one by one so they can tell us a little bit about their work and then hopefully come together at the end for some questions. So let's start with Kadar. So if Kadar can unmute and get his camera ready. There, welcome Kadar. Thank you for having me, Wendy. Nice uh, we're so glad you could join us. This is a very exciting film. Um, I think we saw some scenes of it in Les Ark. Yes. Um, so yeah, can you tell us a little bit about um, yeah, how you found the right producers for the film. And it's quite a special film because it's shot in Djibouti. You know, how did you find the right team? And, and then how did you get the money together and get it started? Uh, well, um, the thing is, I had a story that was set in Djibouti. 
in East Africa. And uh, to my knowledge, no Finnish feature film has ever entirely been made in Africa. I mean, there have been uh, feature documentaries and shorts and etc., but no feature film. So I knew the kind of challenge that I was getting myself into. So to do that, I needed to find a production company that would guarantee me three things. Um, the first one being um, freedom, the second one being um, adventure, and the third one being protection. And by freedom, I mean a production company that would allow me to have the artistic freedom to make the kind of film that I wanted because I was the only person in the entire crew who could understand the language, mm. you know, that, that, that was spoken in the film. So, um, and I, who could understand the culture and everything. And by adventure, I mean like a production company that would be um, willing to leave the comfort zone, um, take a risk and go on this adventure to the other side of the world to make this film happen. And, and by protection, I mean a production company that would put the filmmakers first before the project, take care of the well-being of the, um, uh, the filmmakers so that the filmmakers could take care better of the project. So it was the combination of these three elements and more that helped me land on Buffo um, because they really have that reputation. And, uh, and I, to be honest, I couldn't have asked for a better um, partners than, than them. Yeah, Bufo's a great company. When you went to them, did you have your whole script ready or did you have just the idea at that time? Uh, yeah, I mean, I had the, the, the script has been in the process of making for, for quite some time now, you know, and I approached them after the Sydney Foundation residence in Cannes mm -hmm. Film Festival. So, um, it, you know, and, uh, and they were very enthusiastic about it. You know, they, uh, I mean, they were, I think, in, in a point in their career where they have made so many films in Europe, inside Europe. So I think they, they were in a peak where they just wanted to really go farther and, and to, you know, to uh, do more experiments and just, you know, like uh, uh, take a risk. Hmm. And, uh, and I think that was uh, one of the reasons that w why they went on this uh, project. And when you partner with Bufo, do they then go to the Finnish Film Institute to seek some funding? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, we, I got fundings, I mean, uh, student writing grants and uh, uh, stuff like that from the Finnish Film Foundation. So the Finnish Film Foundation was already on board. I mean, they were already really excited about this film before I approached Bufo. So yeah. I had them, I had their back, you know. Uh, yeah. So that helped me a lot, you know, to to have the confidence to go to Buffo, uh, yeah. this film. And had you made a lot of shorts or, or done any TV or anything before this? I, I have made uh, short films, but this is the first film that has been publicly funded by the government that I'm directing. I made some shorts, but I did it independently with my colleagues and, and, and friends. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so this is the first uh, with funding. Uh, funding, exactly. So there you go, New Yorkers who are tuning in, even though they might have backings, you know, sometimes you just got to do it the old fashioned way too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and the film, is the film in post-production now or what's going on? Yes, it's in post-production now. And uh, we are planning to have the film finished by the fall. Okay. If everything goes fine. Yeah. And in terms of the um, uh, funding, mm. because this is a finished production, yeah. uh, written and directed by an African born, uh, uh, set in Africa, acted by all Africans, and is spoken in one of Africa's language. So it was, it, it took a little, it, an unusual route, uh, funding wise, because um, once we had the Finnish Film Foundation on board, we were able to get um, fundings from places that Finnish films were not eligible for, you know. Ah. <laughs> the likes of, you know, uh, Cinema du Monde, Cinema du Monde from France and right. World Cinema Fund, you know, from Germany and, you know, um, from the Middle East as well, from the Hafen Institute and, you know, other cultural fundings. And uh, so uh, it took a, a different route than um, uh, most Finnish films that are set in Finland or, or in Scandinavia. So that was also a very learning process for me, you know, because 
as a dual uh, citizenship, I'm also eligible for some funds from uh, East, uh, Middle East and Africa. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's fascinating the way you've been able to, to pull that all together and also make the film you want to make. Absolutely. Yeah. You, know, you had that freedom to make what Absolutely. you want to make. Absolutely. And since nobody could understand anything on set, I could do whatever I want. <laughs> <laughs> That's a sort of benefit, I think, that, you know, your producer can't tell the actor what to do. Yeah, I mean, it, it, Only it, you can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But then it can also be challenging because sometimes you need somebody on your shoulder that can correct you like, oh, maybe Khadar, you know, that didn't, uh, that line didn't go well because you're the only one who understands and you have, you know, uh, your whole team who don't understand. So it, it, it has its own benefits and also, uh, uh, you know, uh, no benefits. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, thank you, Kadara. We'll come back to you when we open up some questions later. That was really interesting. I, I wanted to go next um, to another filmmaker who's really crossing borders, and that's Nathalie. Um, so Nathalie is, uh, hello, good morning. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about your background and what, you know, Clara Sola is a film made overseas and how it all came together. Yeah, uh, well, I was born in Sweden, but I grew up in Costa Rica. I did like school and high school there and then went back to Europe to study filmmaking and, and miming, actually. Um, uh, so when I and I did all my shorts either in in Sweden or the US because I went to Columbia University okay. in the screen ready program. So but when I was thinking of making the feature, I really wanted to go back to the place I grew up in and talk about some things over there. And what's the film about? Uh, well, um, it's a, I'm not great at summaries, but it's a, about this uh, woman who is around 40, who's uh, kind of seen as a saint in her village. So people come to her for prayers, even if she doesn't really like uh, people in general, like uh, new people. Uh, so it's about her emancipation from this role in the town and her sexual awakening, because being a saint and being a sexual being is not compatible, kind of. Thing. Interesting. Realism elements into it. Yeah. Um, and so how did you say, I mean, did you have a producers in Sweden or and in Latin America? Or how did you bring the production together? Yeah, uh, I met producers in Sweden, actually through like a speed dating thing with for producers and young directors that a small festival arranged. So it's important that Festivals keep doing this kind of thing for new filmmakers. Which, too. which festival was that? Just so we give them props. Uh, stock motion. Stock it's motion, cool. In Stockholm. Okay. Um, and there I met, I met a producer. I sent him the film. He never answered. <laughs> uh, and then I was like, hey, what's up? And he said like, hey, you know what? It's not for me. But he was kind enough to say like, there are some producers coming from Colombia. Maybe you want to pitch to them. So you can come to my meetings with them. And at the end of them, you can pitch to them. Uh, which was really kind and he stayed for every pitch and in staying he understood what I wanted to do and that's how I got to meet this is a company is called Hubab and I got to meet his partner and then I started to work with with Nima Yousefi which is now like my not only producer but like creative partner hopefully forever. <laughs> so. Yeah no it's wonderful when you find that right producer that you do feel like is your partner and not just for one film I think that can be so crucial yeah, yes, it's good to find people that, you know, kind of believe in your, whatever you're doing and in the core of it, because the process is so long that you'll doubt about it and you'll hate it and you're, and they remind you like, hey, remember, it's because of this. And even when you're like going off just to follow some mainstream stuff or whatever, they'll be like, hey, remember. So, yeah. Yeah. And where did you get money to make the film? I'm just going to talk money. Yes, um, well, we have four co-producing countries um, and we have like 10 producers <laughs> or like co-producers, producers. Um, so we started in Sweden with some like regional funds that were the first ones to believe in us, which was big for us because it's a movie the same as Kedar, you know, it doesn't look Swedish on screen because yeah. it's in Spanish and we were kind of, you know, aware of this going into it and didn't know how open people were going to be about funding it in Sweden. So we went for, you know, kind of a low key, not to ask for too much. Yeah. <laughs> Still, we need to have like enough. So we uh, did the Swedish Film Institute, some regional funds, World Cinema Fund. Um, then we got a, a Belgian co-producer, which is where I'm now. I'm in the editor's house. <laughs> oh, 
Um, and uh, well, Costa Rica, of course, because that's the place where I wanted to shoot it. We, I come up with some producers and we have actually a producer from the US also. So, which is the only place that those doesn't have regional yeah. or any funding <laughs> from yeah. the government. So sorry. Um, but, um, and then, then most of the people we met in, in like labs or the kind of, this kind of things, the producer had other labs like Ave Puentes and they, they meet people that are doing other films so that they are, are following our film and know it quite well. So, and come in it for the love of it. Because even if it is funding from the government, you still need to put a lot of work in it. And oh, if yeah. you get the funding, then you did a lot of work not getting paid. So you really need people that are committed and believe in it. Yeah, I don't think anybody's necessarily getting rich from this funding. Yeah, no. we should also say it's not just money flying around to everyone. No, you um, can yeah. a lot of, you know. <laughs> Was it complicated or sort of overwhelming for you as, you know, this is your first feature and just having all these partners and how did you know, you know, you wanted to keep your creative control of this. Did, you, did, did that lead producer sort of help protect you from all the other voices or how did you manage, you know, so many people on board your first film? Maybe he did protect me and I just don't know <laughs> because I'm so protected. But I, feel, I felt that I was asking for input from everyone who mm. wanted to, to give it. I know I was kind of protected more during the shoot and maybe things were filtered, um, but I did want to get feedback. And all the people I'm working with, fortunately, like all the producers, I trust in like creatively and they could all like, I can say they all contributed some way in the story or in the shoot or, and also it, I think one thing that's difficult is that maybe I wanted to work with people I've worked with before just to feel some safety because it's mm. your first step. Uh, and it's hard because there's that point system that you have to work with creative people with everywhere. And in the beginning it was hard because, you know, it's new people, but now I think it's really good because it, makes you work with new people and now wonderful things are born from it from collaborations that wouldn't have otherwise so I'm now I'm really really happy about it actually that's a great attitude because yeah there are you don't get everything you want do you well no at the end I'm really happy yeah. with everyone so yeah great um and the film is you you mentioned you're at your editor's house so you're editing the film now yes we're in the editing room now so Hopefully. And so hopefully we'll see the film in 2021 or what do you think? Yeah. That's the idea. Yes. Okay. Good luck with the edit and we'll come back to you when we do some questions at the end. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I think we'll go next to Erica in Norway. Well, I don't know if she's in Norway, but she'll tell us. Um, who is the writer director of Storm and she's coming online. There's Erica. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Um, so yeah, are you in Oslo or where are you based? Yes, yes. in Oslo, yeah. Um, and with Storm, this is a film that's not shot yet, correct? No. 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 So yeah, maybe tell us a little bit about how you've been setting it up and when you hope to shoot it. Yes, we're going into production in uh, this fall. Uh, things have been a bit pushed because of the coronavirus and everything that happened, but now it's things are starting to open up slowly. So we're hoping to start shooting in October. Great. And what, tell, tell us a little bit about the film itself. What, what is it and why is it a story you wanted to tell? Um, so the film is about um, an eight-year-old girl, Storm, um, who is accused of being involved in the death of her little brother. He dies in, um, uh, he drowns in a river uh, while they were out playing. Um, and then we follow the mother who kind of deals with these accusations and tries to protect Storm from the accusations while at the same time, um, her own doubts about what really happened um, while dealing with that and how that affects their relationship. Mm. And if this, um, I'm assuming you've done some shorts or, or something before, is that right? Yes, yes. I've done some shorts and also some tele series and other things. Um, it's, been a, it's been a film that um, I started writing in film school uh, way, way back. And then um, uh, coming out of film school, it, me and the writer, Johan Fosting, uh, we won um, the pitch prize at the Nordic Talents in 2014. 
Um, so, and then we started writing it that year. So it's been with us for a very long time, but um, as you were saying, getting fi financial uh, funding, even from the government is very difficult. It takes a lot of time. Yeah. Um, so it's been with me for a very long time, but now finally we've got set up um, and it's going to happen. So I'm very excited about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's great. To, so many years of, of dreaming of, of doing it and now you mm. can do it. I was just mm. curious, you know, maybe this doesn't sound like the easiest first feature, you know, especially yeah. working with young kids. And was anybody saying to you, oh, Erica, maybe do this as your third film and do something easier for your first film? Um, like, no, nobody's told me. I've, I've been thinking about it. <laughs> no, don't say it like that. Like, why yeah. am I doing this as my first feature? Um, and so kind of um, now looking back, I'm, I'm kind of happy that the project has been allowed to grow and and for me to grow and for me to do other things and develop as a filmmaker before doing this story. I wouldn't have said that um, for, uh, in 2014. Uh, but now I think maybe it, it, it's done some good to the film that, it's, um, that I've developed and done some other things. So yeah. um, maybe it's a good thing. But then still, again, um, I started, started like writing this uh, seven, eight years ago. And you know, there's no um, guarantee that what you are interested in and what you are passionate about um, when you're 23 is the same as when you're 30. Yeah. Um, so I think, it, I mean, I think for, for me, for this film, it was a good thing to have some time, but still, I don't think that's, I think it also can, can destroy some momentum and potential and some um, drive in, in other kinds of projects. Yeah. And I really had to stop with myself from, from time to time and be like, okay, but is this really my film still? Is it really what is, is it really something that I need to develop and that I can be, that I'm interested in? And luckily I've kind of always, because it's such a complex project, um, I'm, it's, it's, it really means a lot to me still and I'm not done with the film, even though it's been around for a lot of years. Oh, I think that's really, I mean, you can tell you're passionate about it, just the way you're talking about it today. But I think it is a really nice point to make is that, you know, some people get so fixated on something as that's going to be their first film. And yeah, like they might be 25. Mm. And I think if you're really inflexible, mm. um, if you don't get to make that till you're 32 or 33, mm. maybe ask yourself if you are still so passionate for the right reasons or do you mm. need to evolve it or something? I mean, for you, it sounds like it's definitely, you know, mm. this is a passion project for you that you have to get made is the mm. way it sounds when you're talking about it. But I think for some other films, you have to be open to letting a project evolve over the years as well. Absolutely. Just, Absolutely. Just my weird advice this morning. Um, <laughs> and is it right that you've got your homage support for the film? Yes. Yes. So that's amazing. Mm. So for people who don't know, um, your homage is the Council of Europe's co-production fund. Um, so, and it can make a big difference. And it's also, you become sort of another seal of approval mm. of a Euromage film. Mm. Um, how, so what, what countries is it co-producing with? Uh, with Sweden. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, do you think that Euromage support makes a big difference? Um, yes, it definitely does. <laughs> it does, um, both financially, that it's going to help uh, make the film and not put us in such tight drains that we have to really um, go down on the, on the days of shooting or really push this young girl that we're able to have time with her and to uh, really try to make the best movie possible. Um, and also just, um, I, I, was, I was very happy just to hear that, that the film and the themes that really resonated with so many different countries um, and uh, that there, so much, there was so much excitement about the films at, um, at the UMH and, and kind of, it makes me hope that it's something that can reach out to not just um, the Norwegian audience, but hopefully um, resonate with lots of different people, countries. Great. And remind us again um, when you're going to shoot and when we think the film might be ready to see. Yeah, so it's uh, going to start shooting in October and hopefully we'll have the film finished next year. Okay. Oh, we can't wait to see it. Okay. Good mm -hmm. luck. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. And we'll come back to you at the, at the end as well. Um, we're going to switch straight over to Iceland um, with Tina. And she's looking so scandy. She's got the right 
Icelandic jumper. She's got the huga wood paneling. Perfect. Um, so Actually, I, I made it myself. I just wanted to brag. Ah, well, I'm yeah. going to be in touch separately so I can get one <laughs> for my next trip to, to Reykjavik. Um, so yeah, how did you find, you know, you're someone you've worked in theater, you've worked in short films, and how did you find the right producers and partners for Quake? Oh. Tina might be frozen or taking a very long time to answer. At the, oh, I the film center. Oh, Tina, I'm sorry. You yeah. froze up for a little bit, so maybe I can, froze up. Yeah, we're gonna turn off your video. Yes. So maybe just uh, speak in audio, but maybe restart because we didn't hear much of that. Okay. So, um, partners. Okay. Um, uh, yes. Uh, when I started off this journey with the uh, quake, I didn't uh, uh, approach any producer in the beginning because. Um, uh, you know, there are five steps when you're applying for funding at the Icelandic Film Set Center. You have to get three script grants, and then there is the development grant, and then finally the protection grant. And uh, uh, when I applied for the three uh, script grants, I uh, did it in, my, in the name of my own company. I have myself my own company called Freya Filmwork. So uh, when I got those grants, and the next step would be to apply for the development and production grant, I needed to reach out for another producer, uh, which had much more experience than I did. And uh, yeah, so, um, and uh, that was uh, very interesting because I talked to a few of them and got really positive uh, reaction to it. But I was quite selective uh, about uh, who I wanted to do this project with because, um, of course, I, the, the producer needed to be very experienced, well connected and, um, yeah, a person that would uh, herself uh, connect to the to the project and have the share the same vision as me and would uh, of course being easy to get along with because of course it's like you're going into this temporarily marriage with another person so everything had to click so uh, when I uh, met Helen Johannesdotter who is my producer huh. now we we were sort of in a similar position at that time because she's very experienced. She has been working with a lot of projects and, and produced a lot of films and stuff. But when I reached her, she wanted, she had been, she had been doing it with others. She was at that uh, time where she wanted to create her own company, which is called Usus Parvus. Uh, so that was, so Quake is in a way the first feature film Ursus Parvis is going to produce as as this is also my first feature film. So we had this connection bond of really doing it well, although she is very experienced. This is her first feature under the name of her company. So yes, I know Helene. She's a great producer. I'm glad you found yeah. each other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we we just clicked. She is uh, she's so inspiring and and uh, yeah, I we 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 we've been doing a lot of good things together, we believe. <laughs> and I know in Iceland, um, there's, you know, it's a small population. There's a lot of great filmmakers working there, though. I mean, yeah. per capita, it must be some of the highest in the world of filmmakers and musicians in Iceland. Um, and the Icelandic Film Center is wonderful. Um, but, you know, they don't have as large a pot of money as they would love to, I'm sure. So I know sometimes in Iceland, you kind of have to wait your turn. Like the film center will say, Tina, we believe in you. We believe in this story, but the funding is promised this year, but maybe you can go next year or the year after. Did that, any of that happen to you? Um, I don't know. It's uh, quite difficult to uh, know the reason why everything is going re really, really well. But I do think that there are some elements that helped us in our, um, in our, um, journey and that is it's uh, quake is an adaptation of a bestseller novel and to begin with uh, when i got the filming rights it was the latest novel of a very accomplished author here in iceland so that was a huge step for me i mean if the author uh, believes in me well okay maybe i get the attention from the film center so 
Um, so it's a bestseller. It's an awarded novel adaptation. I had done some, I had done two shorts before and uh, they had been traveling all around the world on film festivals. They had got awards. Um, so, but also another thing that we did is that we applied for many, you know, talent labs, script labs, mm. stuff like that. So, and when I got accepted to TIFF Talent Lab, which is now called TIFF Filmmakers Lab, lab I mean, that is a one step. And then we got into talent, Black Knights Film Festival co-production market. We got also into the script pool. We were pitching at Hogesen to the Norwegian Film Festival. It, the development process was the, 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 the markets outside of Iceland were really noticing this project. So of course that helps uh, us to uh, be more confident when we apply finally for the production grant. So um, also um, I'd like to mention that the Icelandic Film Center is now more uh, focused on gender equality. And this yep. is a film that is produced by a woman, written by a woman, uh, the main character is a woman, directed by a woman. So maybe that is, of course, I don't know, but it might also be help because you have to now, they, they are really focusing on gender e equality now, and they, which I think is very great. Yeah, I think that is wonderful to hear. Um, I'm also yeah. just really glad you brought up all those labs, co-production markets. Um, yes. I think those can be so important in a film's journey. And a lot of people yes. are scared really. to apply or don't know which one is good. Um, but a lot of those can help people, especially with it's your first feature, get you known in the industry a little bit more. So there are, you know, yeah. of them. some are better than others, but yeah, yeah. I think they can be crucial. So I'm really glad to hear you did some. It's crucial. I went to midpoint with the script and also uh, I went to this great retreat at Mallorca, which um, Marietta von Hauswolf, she was, the, she was um, you know, uh, uh, doing this retreat. And there I got some great script consultants, Savina Norotti from uh, Torino Film Lab, Jula Castag from Sundance Film Lab. So all these, all these uh, elements, of course, makes the application stronger you know with yeah. all this talented experienced people that have you know give their blessing to the project yeah it's amazing so that's really good advice for for other filmmakers to check out some of those yeah. initiatives yeah and it means you're also building your network because filmmaking can be quite a lonely business yeah of course you're in your house writing a script for the 20th time maybe you've got a network of people internationally that you can at least vent to um, or have a, a beer over Zoom um, when you're having a bad day. I think that can be <laughs> important as well. So yeah, know your peers who are trying to get first features made. Yeah. Well. So thank you, Tina. Um, we're gonna go to Denmark now with Lisa Jesperson, who is uh, finishing her first feature, which is called Persona Non Grata. Hi, Wendy. Hi. I brought a, a little plant oh. myself because I saw yours and I thought, yeah, uh, thanks. And uh, we actually did finish the film. Oh, uh, finished. Okay, wow. Finished and yeah, thanks. <laughs> and uh, we just got the, actually yesterday, we got the news that we were selected in the Danish Cinema Club. I don't know if you Okay, know this it. is huge deal. Yeah, because it's amazing. So, they only select a few films every year and it means yeah. way more people get to see the film. Yeah. Especially so, for a first feature, that's just amazing news. Yeah, so, it was very cool. nice for us to know, yeah. Wow. Um, and do you know when they're going to put it out? Have, did they tell yeah, you? Yeah, uh, they're going to premiere it the 1st of July, 2021. Okay. You've so got we, uh, we hope for a shitty summer next year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's too hot right now to go. Yeah, to so perfect. definitely. Yeah. definitely. Um, and talk us a little bit about how you found um, the right producers, the right sort of finance package to make Persona Non Grado. I mean, uh, this film is funded by the New Danish Screen, which is uh, like a talent scheme under uh, DFI, the Danish Film Institute. So it's a really small budget. Uh, we made this film for less than 700,000 euros. So it's a very small budget. Uh, but I kind of felt safe uh, about that actually, uh, since I never worked with like a huge budget, I felt kind of safe that we could do it our way. Uh, and also I got quite surprised when I finished film school 
because I, I had this idea that, you know, you're, you're done with film school and then you're going to sit in like an attic and work alone for like many, many years and have no jobs and stuff. So I graduated and then uh, I got surprised because my graduation film um, was about fi women in their 50s and like in 60s and how to deal with, you know, that crisis that can happen in that time of your life. And in Denmark, uh, it's like the women in their 50s that buy all the cinema tickets. So I almost got like <laughs> attacked by any uh, company in Denmark uh, with like feature films. I think the first two months after I graduated, I got offered like six features and two books of adaptation. And I was like, I didn't know how, how to handle all this because I thought you're so spoiled if you don't like say yes to making one of these films. And then I start reading all these scripts and then I found out all the films were like about women in their 50s. So now I know how it is to be like an actor who, who gets typecasted every time to make a film. And I thought, you know, they, they were all really like mainstream films and like made for selling a lot of tickets. And I saw that it was kind of difficult or like uh, dangerous for me to do stuff like that. Uh, so instead of like becoming a small fish in, you know, like a Centropa sea or ocean. I, I chose Hyena Films, yeah. uh, which is a, a very small company. And it, at that time, it, uh, it was just uh, started. Uh, yeah, very new a, when you joined them. Very new, yeah. They were starting up uh, their first feature production uh, at that time when I joined them. They shot at uh, Sons of Denmark. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so I was, instead of the small fish in the sea, I was like the, the big fish in a, the little hyena pond. And that made sense for me because I know my producer now, like we went to film school together and yeah. Um, there was one of the other participants in this webinar who said like, it's nice to have a producer who kind of like when you're getting off your own path, then they kind of like push you in again. That's definitely how I feel with, with my producer, Daniel, so. Yeah, that he really gets you, he gets what you want to do yeah. with the film and can help support you in doing that. It's what yeah. you want the producer to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you mentioned you could have made these bigger films about middle-aged women. Um, they could have been a big box office success. But this was a more passionate, more personal story for you. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the story itself and, and why you knew this was going to be your first feature. Yeah. I mean, the film is about uh, being a young woman coming from the countryside and moving into the city and trying to become an artist. And that is uh, essentially my own life. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, I, as you know, I grew up uh, in the country and my dad is a farmer. And in the beginning I thought, you know, oh, I'm from the countryside, so I should probably make films about uh, being out in the fields and in the nature. And, and then I made these short films and, and I kind of like, got a bit bored or tired of it. And I didn't find them that interesting. And then I realized that uh, it was um, something completely different that I had to make films about. It was more, you know, like uh, the clash of uh, coming from, you know, the countryside and then coming back there. Um, and for me, this film was very much a search um, for myself in like trying to figure out who, who I am. Sounds kind of like, uh, very artistic blathering, but um, yeah, uh, I, I think it was very important for me at least um, to figure out, yeah, my roots in a way. Um, yeah. yeah. It makes and sense. I tend to think of New Danish Screen, which has just, you know, resulted in some amazing films. Um, you know, you it kind of needs like an authored voice. I mean, it can't just be, you know, something you would see on TV, I guess. No. Um, so, yeah, I guess how, how did you sort of envision maybe the visual style of the film and the point of view that, you know, isn't just sort of Sunday night television telling this story. This is you. Yeah. The I mean, I have this, uh, I don't know what, if I'm cursed or something, but uh, I, I, when I start writing something, uh, people see it as like this mainstream stuff. And then you get in, into a, a crisis as an artist because then you're like, oh, I'm not mainstream, I'm an artist and stuff. So I'm kind of like battling with this stuff. Uh, but I think what I do is like, uh, I write a story and for some reason it kind of like, people kind of get it. <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's uh, my parents, you know, 
totally get the film. My grandparents totally get the film. My niece, uh, who's 18, get the film. So it's like, it's a broad audience. But of course, I want to uh, tell the story in the right way. So it's about who you work with, I guess. And I've, I was so lucky to get uh, the cinematographer on this film is uh, Manuel Alberto Clau, who's, uh, who shot the latest Las Pantria films. Mm. And he's an amazing person who just listen to any director who matter, or no matter who you are. And we kind of try to develop a very personal style for this film. So I think that yeah, we succeeded with that, I hope. No, I, I definitely think so, because I've seen a bit of it, um, some clips and yeah, it yeah. Does, feels like it's your vision coming yeah. to life, but <laughs> the way that people can watch it on a Friday night and enjoy it. Yeah. So that, that's not a bad thing. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> um, great. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, we'll Thanks, come back around to some questions. Um, last but very much not least, um, we might even call her our can star of the day, who is Nina uh, from Sweden. Um, as I mentioned, her uh, feature debut, Pleasure, has been selected for the Cannes label. Super exciting. I've been personally tracking this film for about four years. Um, and I remember visiting the Swedish Film Institute about, yeah, four or five years ago. And they were, I was asking about filmmakers and they were like, well, you're gonna keep your eye on Nina. I was like, okay, yeah, got her name in my mind now. So Nina, you're here and Pleasure, which used to be called Jessica, um, Pleasure is totally finished? Yes. Um, it's or not speaking. totally finished. Okay. Um, we still, because we have, because of uh, partly Corona, we have um, some last uh, like um, audio, how do you say, mixing and grading because we, I'm supposed to go to the Netherlands to do the last, because um, we, it's a co-production. So um, there's some final, like we don't have the DCP, but yeah. Okay, but you're almost there. Yeah. And that must feel good. Yeah, it feels really good. <laughs> Because um, tell us how many years you've been working on this film, because it's a lot, and yeah. how it's sort of flowed and gotten to where it is today. Yeah, I mean, in a way, I started 10 years ago. Um, that's when I had the idea. <clears throat> uh, and then, but then first I made a, a short film with the same title, Pleasure, uh, that got uh, into the Critics Week in Cannes in 2013. Um, and so, and I knew already then that I wanted to make a feature, but at that time I wasn't in a position where that felt like a, an opportunity. <clears throat> so I used the short as some kind of also pilot in a way. Um, and I felt almost like when it came to Cam and it got a lot of attention, I, I just felt very, very certain that, uh, like that the feature would happen because uh, so many people showed interest and I, I felt that I was on to something um, <clears throat> that like it hadn't, it had, like it's never been done before, uh, a portrait of the porn industry from female perspective, like contemporary. Um, <clears throat> and, but then I was still in film school, so I had to finish film school, but I started to develop uh, and I got some funding, development funding during film school as well for the feature. So I was able to go do research in, in the porn industry in LA. Uh, and then when I graduated uh, 2015, <clears throat> I started to work full time on this project. So I've been working full time for five years. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's been a very long process because I had to go to LA and really like dig my way into the porn industry and live there with these people and be part of that culture in a way uh, to be able to tell this story the way I did because <clears throat> in, in a way it's also like I mean it's it's totally fiction but it's still in a way a hybrid documentary because everything I mean except from the main character everyone is played by actual people in the porn industry and it takes place on actual locations there uh, and so everything is based on the research and the real world. So I had like, I found the main character, um, Sofia, uh, who plays this 19 year old Swedish girl. Uh, and uh, 
And she was also, she was an amateur. She had never shot anything before, never been in front of camera. But like, she played this character. So like, uh, uh, but I took her to this world and just like let her, like creative situations where people uh, were like playing themselves almost. So it, it, and I kind of like invented my own method as I was going along. Uh, and uh, yeah, and so it's been, it's, it took a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, I want to write a book just about how you made this film because there's a lot yeah. to talk about. Um, how did you find the right producers and the right money? Because obviously, you know, some financiers just aren't going to want to touch anything that they think is going to be pornographic or about porn. You know, did you have to, you have to find the right people for this special kind of film? Yeah, I mean, when... <laughs> It wasn't that hard uh, to get a, with the topic as we like as may, maybe I thought from the beginning. Uh, especially like the, most of the funding is uh, from Sweden, so like the Swedish Film Institute and SVT is like national Swedish television and regional fund for invest, uh, and the, there were never any like. I mean, yeah they totally understood like why the purpose of it and they had confidence in me as a filmmaker because I was been doing films about these topics for so long so they understood that it was like it came from the right place and that it was necessary and that it was important um and uh, uh but when uh, with the producers I uh, I I got to know Ruben Östlund <clears throat> um which he's like a big inspiration like yeah inspiration for me and he uh, invited me to meet his uh, producer Erik Hemmendorf at Platform uh, and um, yeah so uh, I liked the way they were doing films uh, and um, so I started to work with them and then also <clears throat> um, uh, Eliza Jones and Marcus Valto which were my producers from school that I went to film school with so we had just like uh, collaborated on a short film so then they because I I, uh, I need to work like very close to producers like very hands-on and uh, creatively to like discussing every detail constantly so um, and Eric is not uh, I mean he's not he doesn't have that time to be that present so uh, Marcus and Eliza have been very close working very close to me <clears throat> um, and um, yeah. Wow. Um, and did anybody, um, you also have a great sales agent. I know Pap uh, versus yeah. Phil, who, you know, is a huge fan of this film and I've been talking to him about it for years. Um, I'm curious if anybody ever tried to hurry you saying, oh, you've been doing this for five years. We need to get into Cannes 2019, so finish it or? Um, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, in editing, definitely, because <laughs> I've been editing for a very long time. Uh, and um, yeah, everyone, uh, like everyone have been uh, in a way frustrated that it's been taking so long. But, but then when they've seen the progress, they also like understood why. So they've been support, like every time they, yeah. So they, they, they kind of, they see why uh, and they understand it and they understand that it has a great value. And in the end, I think everyone is just, they want the film to be as good as possible. And they also understand that this project is, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, because it, it's, it's never been done before in a way. So like, it, it really needs to be, uh, be the best it can be. So like to rush it is, it would not be fair. Yeah. Uh, in the, uh, um, during financing and script writing, it was the other way around. Like I was very frustrated because <clears throat> I felt I didn't get the trust that I wanted from funders. They, uh, I was like, I had to rewrite the script for about a year from like, uh, where I, in a way, like I already had the, the film, uh, the structure and the way I worked, like, one year of script writing was just for show for the producer for funders because I mean I never even showed the script to the actors like we improvised and the way I like 
I don't work in that way that the script has that kind of value. The script is there for the structure and to understand like how the scenes are connected, but then uh, so much, uh, like I base the characters on real people and then I go along with them and also like in a way build the film in editing as well. Cause, uh, and I shoot like, like super like, enormous amount of material uh, like in the documentary uh, with like also different uh, variations of like how a scene could end or begin um, so like so many hours of script writing totally wasted uh, because the, and I, I mean I understand they didn't they didn't know because they had never it, it's my first feature so they couldn't like just trust me uh, but uh, yeah, that was really frustrating because I, I felt that I, I mean, I have the film, it's, I'm ready, like I'm ready for it. But then they were like, nah, but really write again, I really write again. And really, like, so I just had to please them. Um, yeah. for... But that sort of year was not even for you developing no. the film, it was for them so that you could get the money to make the yeah. film so they knew what you were going to do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, just on a personal toll, uh, you know, working for five years, on a film, um, you know, it probably means you've not done other work. I don't know if your family relationships, you haven't seen your family as much or, um, you know, has that been tough on you personally? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I have a lot of like, how do you say, uh, not redemption, but I have, I mean, I, I, I really, I, I'm working on my relationships now and like I have to, but I apologize for, to so many people for being, yeah. for not being present and being very like egocentric because like every time we talk it's just about like the film and me and like oh panic constant panic and so and they had to like just be support supportive supportive supporters for so many years and yeah that definitely yeah i owe i owe them a lot yeah well i'm sure that's something you know even if you're on a shoot for three months you kind of go into a bubble and i'm sure that's something a lot of the other filmmakers can relate to. So I'd like to bring everybody back up and off mute um, because I did, I wanted to ask, and I think everybody will have a slightly different experience. Um, you know, sometimes people don't like to listen to young people or if you're a first time director and you happen to have um, a, a lighting guy who has worked on 40 film sets, um, maybe they don't want to listen. I was just wondering if anybody had that experience or, you know, were, you, were all of your crew and cast and partners really respectful of you as the filmmaker or did you get any sort of, oh, they're, they're new, let me tell them how it's done. I hope it's the former and not the latter. Anybody? I definitely uh, try what you, what you say, Wendy. Uh, and I don't know what it is with lighting people. <laughs> uh, there's something with the uh, maybe they wanted to be cinematographers and that didn't happen or something I don't know but uh, I had a tough time because my lighting person also like really liked uh, Manuel Claro and uh, probably didn't really know me at all <laughs> but uh, he does now and uh, luckily we got friends still <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, and also you know let's face it some people don't like to listen to women and I didn't even really notice till seeing all your faces. We've got mostly women um, on this panel, which is great. But did you find any sort of chauvinism in on the set that you had to deal with? Or because it was your set, were you just in charge? Um, oh. hey, Nina. Nina, go ahead. Nina first and then Natalie. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, that was really because, uh, uh, I mean, in Sweden, when I've been shooting before, people, know me that I work with because I, I went to film school here so and but so when I because I shot in, in LA and no one know, knew me there and uh, it's also more rare with female directors and especially the way that I work was like totally like they <laughs> most of them were like she doesn't know at all what she's doing um, and um, uh, I think if more of a female method is uh, to because I don't like to be the one who's like just 
telling people what to do, but I always want to like ask for other opinions. And I, when I don't know, I, I, I show vulnerability and like, I don't know what to do here. What do you think? What do you think? I'm not sure. Uh, and, and involve people all the time. And for them, that, that was a weakness. For some people, like they felt that that meant that I wasn't like clear of my vision or that I yeah was weak as a director. So I had to struggle with that a lot. Um, and Natalie, for you. Well, <laughs> I've heard a lot of stories like Nina's from like other friends that had made if like um, women had made, directed films before. So I try to like protect myself from this, but it took like a year to do the casting and gathering the crew. So it was very like we were not only casting the cast, but also the crew in a way by not only how good they were at their craft, but they also they were like people I could hug somehow. <laughs> like, it's like, would I hug this person? Yes. Uh, so I felt very protected in the end when the, with the crew that we got and they were all people I could like hug and that it was okay to be vulnerable. And I said it also, it's okay. I won't know everything all the time. Feel free to say something. If you see something, this sounds like something else, but uh, um, because I don't know everything all the time and I might miss stuff. So, and then I, I got a lot of, uh, good you know feedback and stuff during the shoot which was great and sometimes filtrated through other people so not everyone but um yeah but i was it's sad that you have to guard yourself yeah. against it beforehand yeah tina you're shaking your head yes Do yeah you but <laughs> i i have heard stories about this and I, yeah yeah this is sometimes a problem but in my case i did not have that problem uh, I think uh, the reason is also because my crew was all Icelandic, so I knew all the people that I was working with and I specifically, specifically uh, selected the people I wanted to work with and was so lucky that they were available, so I knew that they would, uh, I've been working with them before, so th th that was not a problem for me, so I think mostly that is the reason because I knew all of them before. Mm. Right. Um, I just thought maybe there's some sales people listening in. So um, Pleasure, we know, has a sales company in Versatile. Persona non grata, you have a sales? Uh, no, not yet. Not yet. Okay, so open for sales. The Gravedigger, are you open for sales? You... Uh, yeah, we're still open. Okay. If I go back to the previous question about yes, um, the women and people not being people listening. 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 Um, it also happens to people of color as well yes. you know and uh as a black man uh who never went to a film school now when i look at this gorgeous talent in front of me i think i'm the only person who never had the privilege to go to a film school you know and uh so when you have people on set who have been who went to film school and who have worked on a lot of films they always question your your choices they always question your vision you always and that can really take a toll, uh, you know, on the director and, and your, you know, and, um, and your vision because they're not in your head. And they're like, okay, maybe you're doing, uh, this is not how it's supposed to go. Why is this taking so long? Why is this scene long? What is this? So, so it can get really, um, uh, uh, first, uh, you know, uh, frustrating. And, um, and yeah, so it does also apply to people of color and, you know, like, yeah. you know, and people who don't go to film school as well. Yeah, I think that's both important. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, yeah, people got to listen to you filmmakers. So that's the whole point, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, Natalie, your film is open for a sales company or do you have one? Uh, no, we're open and we have stuff to show if anyone wants okay. to. And Tina? We're open. Okay, just, to, just in case somebody out there is listening and wants some fresh product, um, there you go. I mean, I salute you all for bringing these unique stories to screen in your own way, for having that passion. And as you said, it can take years. So I know it's years of fighting to get these films made and I can't wait to see them. Um, well done for getting them made. Um, you know, you're some of the lucky ones that have gotten the, the film made. Um, they're going to be seen. We can't wait to see them. Um, thank you all so much for sharing your experience today. Um, I just wanted to wrap up with a few other thank yous. 
Um, but we'll be on the lookout for your films in the next year. So everybody listening has to watch all six films. I know I will. Um, so this is our fifth and final webinar this week for Scandinavian Films, which as you may know is the umbrella group for all the um, Nordic Film Institutes. So thank you so much to everybody at the Film Institutes for um, behind the scenes running these talks, organizing them, coming up with ideas. Particular shout out to Stina, Jakob, Petr, Christoph, Lizette, Yenny. Um, they've just, yeah, been all great collaborators. Um, we're so thrilled to see that the audience showed up to listen to these. Um, but we also know it's been a very busy week at Virtual Can. So if you missed any of the five talks or you wanted to rewatch them or share them with a friend, um, they're going to be all available on YouTube. Um, maybe even later today, um, or definitely by the first of the week. Um, so I think you'll find them on YouTube, but also maybe promoted on Facebook. So if you're interested in watching all five, you can do that. Um, another huge thanks to Emma Morup, who's been running the tech behind all this, and she is just a Zoom goddess. So thank you, Emma, for making sure everything runs smoothly. Um, and just to say, until we meet again, hopefully next year in Cannes on the Scandinavian Terrace with real palm trees and a glass of rosé. So thank you, everybody. Thanks so much for telling us about your films. And thanks to everybody who's helped and joined in and watched. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.